I want to talk about the four phases of cold water immersion. And uh, this is very important for people to understand because most people think everything about cold water immersion is about hypothermia. And we've asked this question, if you fall in ice water with winter clothes on, how long do you think it will take to become hypothermic? And we've just published a study with uh, 661 people who answered this question. And here are the answers. And the number, the percentage of people who answered uh, with various times. And 50% of the people said somewhere between 0 to 5 minutes and another 20% said six to ten minutes. So almost three quarters of the people that we've talked to, and most of these are people who come, who, who come with an interest in wilderness and cold water kind of events, don't know the right answer. You can see an asterisk on the right hand side there. The right answer is more than 30 minutes. If we all went into ice water, it would take more than 30 minutes for us to become mildly hypothermic. And, uh, and that's only four percent of the people got that right. And this misunderstanding is very important because it affects how you act. If you fall into ice water or cold water and you think you're going to become hypothermic in a short period of time, what's the natural reaction? Panic. panic. And this is, this is the common experience. Many people panic. So that's why we think it's very important uh, to have cold water boot camp teach this physiology and so we're going to give you some uh, some background information on this. The four phases are the cold shock response which lasts about a minute, uh, cold incapacitation which can set in within 5 to 15 minutes depending on the temperature of the water and then hypothermia which for most adults is going to be 30 minutes or more and then circum rescue collapse. And uh, they say a picture says a thousand words. In this case, a video says a million. I just want to show you this video of, uh, of a gal that we uh, tested in the state of Alaska. And you just want to watch the temperature of the water here is about 45 degrees. And we told her to jump in and just swim to, uh, to shore. We didn't really think that she was going to. We were, we were looking for a cold incapacitation event. But uh, we learned a tremendous amount. This whole cold water immersion lasted about two and a half minutes. And you probably noticed that uh, when she first got in, she was breathing very heavy. That lasted for about 45 seconds. And then she was able to actually swim fairly efficiently, more efficiently than we thought. And then when she got to the shore, she completely okay. Okay. fell apart. Okay. So although we didn't get the cold incapacitation we were thinking about, we certainly saw the first and the last of the phases, cold uh, shock response and circum rescue collapse. The first phase is called the cold shock response. It can range between zero to two minutes, but usually about a minute. And there are two components, one respiratory or breathing and one cardiac. What everybody will experience is the respiratory gasping and then hyperventilation. And it, it should be pretty obvious what kind of health concern this could be, because if you jump in or fall in and your head goes underwater and you gasp uncontrollably, then you can drown. And we've all heard stories of people who dove into the water and they were never seen again. So it's important to understand that that's going to happen and then look at what can we do uh, to, to make survival better. And, and it's, pretty, it's pretty simple stuff. Often we know that we're going to end up in water, so we tell people, you know, when you go in, if you're going to go in, make sure you keep your head out of the water. If you have a choice, get in slowly. This is a response that is stimulated by cooling of the skin receptors and the rate at which they're cooled. The more skin that's cooled faster, the more response. So if you get in slower, the response won't be as much. And obviously if you are insulated, uh, and this is why when people go, uh, if they're taking part in activities in cold water in shoulder seasons like uh, fall and spring, they will often wear protective clothing so that if they ever end up in the water, they're not going to cool off as quick. There is also the cardiac issue where it puts a lot of extra stress on the heart. You have all that vasoconstriction we talked about before 
and that increases the work on the heart, kind of a stress for it. And uh, for people, we don't know exactly, but we think that primarily for people who have uh, underlying heart disease, this presents a problem uh, for cardiac arrest. And again, we've heard of people who were usually elderly people who were in the water and they were swimming a little bit or they were hanging on for a while and then just they disappeared under the water. And that is probably this cold shock response. So the issue is don't panic, keep calm and get your breathing under control. The second phase is cold incapacitation. And this will set in within 2 to 15 minutes. And again, all of these numbers depend on, on individuality, but, but primarily on water temperature. Uh, the colder the temperature, the shorter uh, the time span. And when you are in cold water, two main things happen. Your nerves get cold and your muscle fibers get cold. And the reason that you can't work as well is as simple as this. Cold nerves and cold muscle fibers don't work as well as when they're warm. That's why, for instance, when we get really cold, our fingers feel numb because those receptors and nerves aren't working as well. Well, now apply that to all of your working muscles, and that's why within a short period of time, you can't operate your arms and legs anymore properly. And if you remember what we said to that first question, all of this is happening while you're perfectly normal thermic. So what we tell people is Think about this and understand it so that if you start feeling weaker, you know that that's because your nerves and muscles are getting colder and as long as you're in the water, they're only going to continue to get colder and you will never get any stronger. There is often a tendency to say, okay, I'm just going to wait for a little while and you know, get my strength back and then I'm going to do something. Well, it's never going to happen. You will only lose strength and coordination the longer you stay in. So, make a plan, figure out what to do, try it, do your best, and if you find that you can't accomplish self-rescue or whatever you need to do to survive, you want to start thinking about, uh, I've got to do something that's going to allow me to stay afloat longer so I widen the window of opportunity for someone to come and rescue me. Thrashing around will not help. If you're starting to get weaker, this is the time to decide, I've got to stop swimming, I've got to stop working, because if you remember back to the infrared picture, the skin was hot because of all the excess blood flow to the periphery, but underneath that, the muscle tissue was colder. So, if you thrash around, you will increase more heat loss, but you will also cool your muscles faster and you'll become exhausted faster. So you need to get somehow get to a secure position and, uh, and wait for rescue. The third phase finally is the onset of hypothermia. And I tell people you're actually lucky if you live long enough in cold water to die of hypothermia. Because most of the deaths that we hear about are caused by the first two phases, cold shock or cold incapacitation. And really, the only way you're ever going to become hypothermic is if you have some form of flotation. Why does it take so long for the body to become hypothermic? Well, the body really is a large mass and it's thermally protected by vasoconstriction. We shut the windows of the house and shivering. We turn on the furnace to fight that decrease in core temperature. So it can take half an hour or longer. So after about 30 minutes, you become mildly hypothermic. And if you continue to stay in the water, after about an hour, you'll become moderately to severely hypothermic. And at this point, because the neural control mechanism from the hypothalamus and the muscles and nerves are colder and those systems aren't working, at this point you lose the ability to move, you lose the ability to shiver, and you also become unconscious. But that's not the cause of death. The cause of death from hypothermia is not loss of consciousness, it's the heart stopping. And your body core temperature can drop another three, four, five degrees after you become unconscious before your heart will stop. So that's an important issue, again, an argument for having a PFD or some kind of flotation because when you become incapacitated and faint or lose consciousness because of severe hypothermia, if there's nothing to keep your head above water, you'll drown. But if there is some mechanism to keep your airway above water and you can keep breathing, you could still live for another hour or more 
before you get to the temperature where your heart would actually stop because of hypothermia. Finally, I want to talk about circumrescue collapse. And that video we saw was very unexpected, but it was a great example of, of uh, what we call circumrescue collapse. And this is something that happens either just before or during or just after rescue. And it's a collapse, and the symptoms range anywhere from fainting or becoming incapacitated to death. Most of the things we hear about is death. And this certainly will happen when a, when a rescue swimmer uh, puts a sling around somebody who is talking to them or, or, or moderately hypothermic in the water and they're lifted up into a helicopter and by the time they get to the helicopter they have undergone circumrescue collapse and died. The mechanism of this partially relates to the flight or fight response. When we're under stress, we have uh, catecholamines like epinephrine or adrenaline pumping through our system and, and we're, uh, we're really maintaining our blood pressure and able to do things with our muscles that normally we couldn't do. And then when rescue is imminent and we see it or we're being rescued, one thing that happens is we can have a mental relaxation and a decreased output of those catecholamines or stress hormones, which help us maintain blood pressure and help us do some work. And so as we saw, when, uh, when the swimmer reached the shore, she, was, she actually was swimming strong and she said, if it wasn't for the shore, I could have kept on swimming and I believe her. But as soon as she reached shore, she, she was safe, no more stress hormones, and her muscles said, we can't do this anymore. And her blood pressure may have even dropped a bit and she collapsed. Now, in this case, she didn't die. And, and she wouldn't, there's no way you would die after two and a half minutes, but someone who had been in the water for an hour or more, uh, certainly this could be a cause of death. So there you have your four phases. Cold shock response, which can kill you within a minute. You have cold incapacitation, which can result in you drowning within five or 10 minutes. Both cases, you'll be perfectly normal thermic. And only really if you have flotation on can you actually get to a point where you become hypothermic and circumrescue collapse is always uh, something to worry about whenever you are rescuing someone. Another reason why you need to be gentle with them when you do take them out of the water. So, do we have any questions about this section? As a water safety instructor, we teach how to enter the water using an ease entry or a compact jump entry. It would appear that we should start modifying our instructions to actually have um, the individual pinch their nose and cover their mouth upon entry since they're doing the gasp reflex. We could learn some lessons from the scuba divers who uh, hold on to their regulator and their mask when they jump in and you could add that instruction to a compact jump that you use one arm to stabilize your PFD and hold your nose and mouth. That'd be a great idea. In the cold shock response, can a person train himself to overcome the effects of the, uh, the cardio and the respiratory responses that they're going to undergo in that first phase? Probably can't do very much about the cardiac response, but if you, if you are exposed to cold water a lot, there's no question that the cold shock response, the gasping and the hyperventilation will decrease over time. We train people to stay with their boat, stay with their boat. Um, for better chances of rescue and survival. Uh, you just mentioned that you know, they shouldn't swim to shore because of the, the, they're gonna be losing a lot of heat. Is it advisable to, uh, or for them to still jump up out of the water if possible on the hull of a capsized boat, say, to remove themselves from this conduction situation, but then it's gonna place them in that convection situation? What would be better, in the water or out of the water? Well, that's a two-part question. The first one is, should you swim to shore? And actually, we're going to talk about that in a separate chapter. But if you are going to stay with your boat, which most of the time is the right decision, there's no question that you should uh, almost all the time get up on top of the boat. Uh, you know, sure, you have conduction in the water, and you're asking, you know, am I going to trade that off for convective heat loss to the air uh, above the water? And uh, there are very, very few scenarios where you would be in you know, zero degree water and the heat loss would be more, you'd have to be in like 20 or 30 below temperature for it to have more heat loss on top of the boat than in the water.